thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this uh, uh, extraordinary session uh, being done by Zoom, uh, normally done in person, um, hosted by American University and the uh, Q uh, group. Um, today's session is co-hosted with executive women uh, in government, uh, and we're very happy to be here. Um, the, the three panelists who are joining us uh, represent a cross-section of um, experience uh, in different agencies of the federal government, uh, and in terms of, of background, uh, education, and uh, in, in terms of uh, their, uh, you know, uh, uh, discussion uh, I think you're going to be uh, very interested uh, in their uh, observations. Um, at this point, uh, I'm going to uh, just sort of introduce the lineup generally before we say a few more words about each of these amazing women. We'll, we're going to begin with Cynthia Cavallari, then we'll go to Dr. Vivian Chen, and um, batting cleanup will be uh, Natalie Vini from uh, Office of Personnel Management. Uh, so. Cynthia Cavallari uh, is, uh, I love this line in her bio, essentially the ambassador for the federal government to the local community. Um, she's the executive director of the Baltimore uh, Federal Executive Board, and um, she's been in that position since February of 2018. Uh, so a couple of years of experience in that pos position, but 17 years of uh, federal government uh, service, uh, as she says, both in boots and in high heels. Uh, so she's been with the US Army, uh, working in a role as a human intelligence collector, um, she's uh, worked with the Office of Veterans Affairs, uh, and now uh, she is uh, doing this uh, ambassadorship of the federal government to the local community. Uh, and I will um, be asking uh, each of our panelists to discuss uh, essentially how, where you've been, how you got to the position that you're in now. Uh, and then um, we'll, we'll do uh, that uh, as I introduce each of them. So let me turn it over to Cynthia with that. Welcome, Cynthia. Thanks, Lynn. I like the two things you called out and I think mostly because one of them will give you the full perspective of where I started to where I am now, you know, serving in this role as the ambassador for the federal government to the local community. So I always like to point out two things about my entrance into and then my path in public service um, without reading my LinkedIn bio to you, without reading the bio that's in the chat to you. So the first one is that a career in federal government was never in my line of sight, but public service was thanks to a lot of the amazing teachers that, that I was exposed to growing up. So as a native Texan and Houstonian, I wanted to stay close to home and go to school in Houston, eventually teach special ed in Houston in the greater Houston area. Um, and then 9-11 happened and it completely changed the trajectory of my career and like a lot of Americans changed my life. Um, I wanted to enlist and I wanted to enlist immediately. Uh, at the time it was only the army for me because of the perception of the organization, the culture, and it was the only branch of service that offered the job I wanted as an entry level position. In fact, I remember sitting in the recruiter's office, you know, they dropped the big binder of all the military occupational specialty specialties in front of you, but they popped a video in and in that video was a non-native Spanish speaker who looked nothing like me. And she was describing her experience and her training as an interrogator or a human collector and a Spanish linguist. And I said, that's the job for me. That's what I wanna do. Of course, they didn't give me Spanish as my language, but that's neither here nor there. Um, fast forward a couple of years, I wound up injuring myself in a routine training exercise. I should have known better, um, but I had to get medically boarded out of the military. And I still felt like there was so much that I had left to give and it was my way of telling the army that you don't get rid of me that easily. Um, so I began applying to jobs, and uh, but I had it in my mind and I had it set that I only want to work for Department of Army. Granted, it was the only thing I was exposed to at the time. So I said, I just want to work as a civilian for the army or another DOD entity, which kind of brings me to my second point, which is that I started as a GS4 secretary in an admin support role back at the Defense Language Institute where the army sent me for my French language training. Um, and I point that out because not everyone starts in government at a higher level. And though I served in leadership roles, even as an enlisted service member, not everyone comes out of the womb wanting to be you know, a leader or hold a leadership role or move towards a senior executive service. I just wanted to get my foot in the door and you know, work hard and, and do my part to help deliver the mission. Um, but I have been fortunate enough to have amazing leaders throughout my career that 
fostered healthy environments and allowed me to be authentically me, supported my willingness to take on varying collateral duties and roles inside and outside of the organization. And through mentorship and sponsorship and allyship, they helped me to grow and prepare for whatever that next step was, which worked out beautifully because all the hats I wore on active duty as an army civilian at the, at the VA Office of Inspector General, um, all of those things positioned me perfectly for this position that I'm in now. So, you know, I think without including the basic training and advanced individual training locations, um, I think I just wrapped up 17 years of federal service, taking you from Houston to Georgia to California to Baltimore to DC back to Baltimore in under three minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very well done. That's the, you know, the, that is who you are in the elevator pitch, uh, little uh, bite-sized uh, nugget. So thanks a lot, Cynthia. Um, and uh, we'll be uh, coming back to uh, tease, to pull some of those uh, threads in terms of your experience. But I want to turn to Dr. Vivian Chen now. Um, and um, I was particularly struck uh, both in reading uh, Vivian's bio, but also in speaking to her the other day. Um, about the fact that, uh, as she says, her career is filled with instances of being uh, the first uh, to uh, break down the bamboo ceiling, both as an Asian American and as a woman. Um, and she uh, has uh, a background uh, in uh, uh, health policy and administration, uh, epidemiology and mental health. Uh, her uh, doctorate is from Johns Hopkins University School of Hygiene and Public Health. Um, she's a retired captain in the US Public Health Service uh, and uh, joined uh, the Senior Executive Service uh, in 2010. Um, she's currently National Director of the Emergency Medical Services Program in the U.S. Forest Service, uh, responsible for implementing uh, an interagency national program uh, to enhance the federal government's medical responses. Um, but she, uh, in that position, has uh, had a number of uh, other uh, experiences uh, across uh, other agencies of government. Um, and she's also, uh, something that I think is uh, very important to point out, the first uh, Asian American or Pacific Islander to hold um, the positions that she's hold uh, that she holds uh, to date. Uh, so welcome, Vivian. Um, and you know, same opening question to you. Um, tell us uh, about where you've been and how you got to the position uh, that you're in now. Uh, thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody, or afternoon. You know, um, one's journey really is a, a, a collection of. Ex, uh, experiences, right? And mine started as a child. I'm a first generation Chinese American. My parents came to this country, couldn't return uh, to China because of the communist takeover. And as a result, my first language is actually Chinese. And I didn't learn English until I was five uh, or in kindergarten. And, <clears throat> but yet I really, it became very clear um, that I was in a, a bicultural, having a bicultural experience. It's brought up very traditionally Chinese, and yet uh, I was f dealing with American culture. Um, back in the time when I was growing up, there was still a lot of uh, backlash about Chinese, and I guess it continues today. But, um, you know, when you're told that you don't belong, go home chink, go home gook, um, I've always felt like an outsider, not as an American, a Chinese American, until um, I got older. And that was when I really got my identity to understand um, things. And, and when I was on the Wisconsin campus during the 60s and 70s, when everyone was protesting, my father used to say, get out of the protest and get back to school. And the reason was, he says, you can't change anything unless you're at the table. And so that's what I always remember. One of my uh, memories of my father was to really um, get into a power where you can, a position where you can change things. Uh, so I've always been involved in social justice and civil rights issues all my life. And um, exclusion is exclusion. And you know, certainly we have battles with even our own uh, minority groups to, because they're so ethnocentric they don't understand that um, changes have occurred as a result of um, sort of um, holding back women and minorities from um, getting into positions of power. 
so how did I get there? I, I, I just kind of worked hard. I, I was fortunate. I opened doors and when I couldn't um, move anymore and I would change jobs, I even left the government a little bit, went into consulting, I ran and b built a multi-million dollar consulting firm, then came back into the government when I had a baby because I thought life would be easier. <laughs> but and I've also endured many administrations and, and I think that the bottom line that I wanted to say is that one has to be flexible one has to really also be open to learning and challenging oneself constantly because I I know when I joined the federal government finally uh, during um, the 70s during uh, affirmative action it was really about women and African Americans you know, minorities was defined mostly like African-American. When you, when you talk about minorities, even though they would collect everyone in that category, the, the um, dedication of funding, et cetera, and special programming and targeted recruitment was really for African-Americans and women. Um, and then that's when you learn also you have choices in life. I mean, back, you know, as a woman's liver, I really believed in my rights as a woman to be at the table um, and yet I found that, you know, we were fighting the different cultural barriers, cultural of sexuality. So back then, you know, there's a lot of vulgarity, there's a lot of flirtation, there's a lot of sleeping with bosses. And that was a way for some women to get ahead. And you have a choice. And so what you have to, and we'll, we'll talk about this later about core values. Um, but, you know, you have choices in life. You always have choices in life. And if you can live by your core values, which I did, it may not always be easy, but you can move ahead. And I'm a Midwesterner, good Midwest, and, and that's where you get really direct conversations, right? Everything you say is what you mean. It's not like on the East Coast where they say something and you try to have to read between the subtext. And those are things, also cultural changes that you have to really adjust to. But as the, a female minority, I think you learn how do you negotiate an organization and still survive because there's a lot of um, challenges. So I'll, I'll stop there. Is that enough, Lynn? Um, <laughs> Vivian, thank you very much for uh, teeing up some uh, areas for us to explore in our conversation. That was terrific. Um, I want to uh, turn to Natalie Vini now, who um, is uh, working at the moment uh, in an extraordinary position um, as uh, acting head of diversity, uh, equity, inclusion, uh, and access uh, for uh, OPM. And uh, she is uh, uh, serving uh, in that role um, and in the moment, uh, only in an acting capacity, but uh, given uh, the things that she said, both in our uh, rehearsal the other day, uh, as well as uh, before folks uh, came into the, the room uh, today, um, I predict that it will not be an, an acting uh, title for long. She's responsible for leading, articulating, and managing um, coordinated government-wide policies and programs uh, related to uh, those issues of of equity, uh, inclusion, diversity, um, and accessibility. Uh, and she um, has uh, worked on cultural transformation and disability initiatives uh, previous to joining OPM uh, at the US Department of Agriculture and at the Defense Intelligence Agency. So, you know, again, uh, to uh, Vivian's point, um, Cynthia and Natalie and Vivian, and certainly in my experience, have all been willing to change agencies. Um, and, uh, you know, that uh, flexibility, I think it's, it's good to uh, underscore that uh, at, uh, at this point as well. Uh, Natalie uh, is an alumna of uh, Spelman College, uh, an historically um, black uh, college, uh, and uh, resides on uh, Maryland's eastern shore. Um, she is, uh, I, I think, in a unique position uh, from her perch at OPM to address a lot of the issues uh, that uh, Vivian uh, and Cynthia uh, have touched on already. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Natalie. Hi, thank you. Um... So how I got here um, is a journey, right? Um, and I too, Vivian, have to go back to my childhood to really round out how I got to be here. And 
there is a central theme and I usually get to it, but there always has to be a story, right? So um, I'm, I want you to picture a, a little old lady. Her name was Miss Gladys. And Miss Gladys Tingle was her name. Um, she loved me. I, you know how you just know when you're loved? She was at my church and she was, she led like Bible study and things of that for the, for the kids, for the youth. But she always made me feel special. Always, um, how I describe it is, she saw in me what I hadn't yet seen in myself, right? And so she challenged me to, to always do great and be nice and be kind and all the Christian values. I grew up with those. Um, and, and, and then she pushed me a little bit. I want you to be a Girl Scout, right? So now we get into that, that public citizen. I'm a citizen, right? I'm, I'm an American citizen. So Vivian, I know what you mean. When, when you don't feel connected, Girl Scouts got me connected to this is my country, right? It's mine. Um, what am I going to do about it? As an eight-year-old, I just wanted to sell cookies, but it goes beyond <laughs> that. Right? So moving on, um, I, I share that Miss Gladys just passed away recently. And so her memory has been in my mind, but I just, you know, if I go back, that's one of my first memories of it. And um, I really, I really um, have been blessed, fortunate, whatever words you choose to describe it, to have multiple people across my lifetime that have saw things in me and said, you should be doing this or you can do that. So when I tell you my path was not very linear, I'm thankful. Natalie would have led herself astray many a time, <laughs> but thankful for the people in my life who said, you know, I think you should try this or you might be good at that. Um, and so I have to stop a little bit at Spelman College because, you know, being a, I come from a small rural town in Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, and so did really well in the public school system, um, always was an avid reader, but you know, you're always the one black girl, right? That was me. I was the one black girl. Whenever that means to you, that's who I was. Um, and so going to an HBCU with women of color, primarily African-American women, but it was all women of color who were super smart. Like I was the one smart black girl, right? And then you go to Spelman, you're like, wait a minute there's all of us, <laughs> what, <laughs> what, who knew? Um, but that changes you. Cause now you're like, well, who am I if I'm not the one smart black girl? So it's a development process that I went through and I really, I really, you know, encourage, I feel like you have to have that at some point in your life around something. And it's where you figure out who you are. Um, and, and if Spellman didn't do anything else um, outside of a great education, I think it's it's selling point today, tomorrow, and the years to come will be how you learn to define who you are and what that means to you to prepare yourself to be that in areas where that may not be accepting of you or that may not be comfortable for you um, and, and to have that home to go back to to get nurtured. Um, I don't want to leave my parents out of this. I had good parents. We're not talking about them today, but that was one of my, my educational experience and how it impacted my leadership journey. And so when we, when we get to working in the careers, it was the same thing for me. People were like, oh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I'm not even going to lie. I was like, I, I like people. That's the one thing I learned early on. People were like, oh, you should get into finance. I don't like numbers. It just makes money. And I just spend it and probably not in good ways. I do people. <laughs> You know, and so once I figured out that people was my jam, like this is what I'm going to do, I really was started off as like a, an HR as a minority recruiter for the Department of Natural Resources. And that led to them saying, you know, you're really organized. Do you think you can manage these grants on accessible public lands? And I was like, I can do that. And started learning about that, started traveling around to parks and learning about accessibility, became the state ADA coordinator left there and I was like oh I took a couple of EEOC courses and I was like maybe I want to go to the federal government and they were like you already know accessibility can you be a disability program manager I can do that learn about that got on to that job ran a global you know disability employment program for the defense intelligence agency and really trained the workforce on you know what that really means the managers the supervisors getting them to understand but that takes a lot, because I don't know if you've been to the Defense Intelligence Agency, but most people don't look like me. They don't wear bright colors like me. They're a great lot. They do a great service to this country, but I was different. 
right? I, I look different. She talks different. She laughs all the time. What are we going to do with her? I had to, I had to learn how to temper some of me. I'm going to say it to get them to hear me because that was what was important to me at that time. And then when I got taught of that, I went to somewhere else, <laughs> right? Because you can only temper yourself for so long. Um, did what I came to do. And now it's time to do something else. Move to USDA because they had started this cultural transformation. I think that's where I first met Vivian. Um, and they had um, this, this great project. I was hired to actually do disability work, right? And then when I got there, they were like, wait a minute. We need someone to look at this data on a monthly basis for the secretary. Can you do that? What did Natalie say? I can do that, right? Mm -hmm. Started doing it. Next thing you know, I'm meeting with the secretary regularly around issues up of the whole department. How did that happen, right? So people seeing in me what I hadn't yet saw in myself, saying you can do this, and me having the confidence to say what I can do it, and and you have to have competence and confidence to really get far in this government. Um, it's it's it's. It's too much good work to do to not be smart and not to be confident about what you're doing. Your public service is important. And so it's, it's why are you here? If you, can't, if you can't answer that question, why are you here? You can get lost in a lot of things. You can get tied down in a lot of office politics or this person doesn't like me or I'm not getting promoted or this isn't working. It, it's all valid. I'm not saying it like it's not valid. What I'm saying is, why are you here? And once you figure that out, once you figure that out, nothing can stop you. Nothing. And I'm, I'm, I get frustrated at my job just like everybody else. Trust me. DEIA was not the hot and popping thing in the past couple of years. <laughs> right? let's, just, let's just be honest here. But I could have gave up, but I, I have a purpose. I know what I want to do for this government, for the wet workforce, for the people of, of America. And so no, we're not giving up. So I would say my, to, to wrap it all up, people, my leadership journey was really around being, you know, inspired by people who wanted to invest in me and, and took a chance and me saying, you know what? I can do anything, I can do it. So let me try it and do my best. And, and that's how I got to be here. That's fantastic, Natalie. Uh, by the way, I noticed that in the chat, we're getting a lot of folks weighing in from uh, uh, HBCU. On the HBCU, sending yeah. you lots of HBCU love. And I love it. it looks like you might have a so roar in here as well. Uh -oh. um, I'm going to say it. I'm saying if I made a support yeah, incorporated. Right. Yes. There you go. My there blue you and go. white. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, lots, lots of uh, great responses uh, on those points. Um, and, and I think that uh, the, the stories that people are telling uh, as well, uh, we're getting a comment uh, about uh, how inspirational these stories are. Um, I do want to key in on some of the things that are common among all of us. Um, and, you know, this is uh, sort of bouncing off of Natalie's point about you don't really know necessarily who you are from early on. I mean, you have to find yourself. And one of the folks in the chat said, uh, that, you know, sometimes finding your tribe uh, is necessary to find yourself. Uh, I know certainly in my own case, I started out at the uh, government that used to be called the U.S. General Accounting Office, now the Government Accountability Office. I remember early on just being struck by the importance of the mission of holding government accountable. And I just loved that there was actually a place in the government that held up different uh, organizations and examine them from time to time uh, and you know, ask the question, is this organization doing what it purports to be doing? Is it worth it that we're spending money to do these particular uh, tasks? And is the organization doing what the federal government is, you know, this particular agency is supposed to be doing what US taxpayers, what the Congress uh, has, has basically signed up for this organization to do. So I love that mission of accountability. And I love the fact that the GAO did that. Was it a good fit for me? No, not necessarily, because there are, guess what? I don't know what I was thinking. A lot of accountants there. I wasn't an accountant. I was from political science. I studied international relations and comparative politics. 
And I was kind of, you know, hadn't figured it out yet, but I love the mission of it. And that was what drew me. And from there, I was able to bounce to uh, another agency uh, to go to the White House Drug Policy Office uh, and work on international, uh, uh, you know, um, politics around uh, the drug issue. Uh, and then eventually that led me to the State Department. Um, and um, part of that was also knowing people in the State Department. Mm -hmm. Part of it is that, you know, knowing people and being able to envision it. The old line about if you can see it, you can be it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I want to open uh, up that line of questioning too um, about uh, how you you were able to to see something um, and then eventually know that you could be something. Um, and, and look at the difference between mentors and sponsors. Because Natalie, when you were talking about, you know, Miss Ingle, you know, maybe that was more of a mentor, but she wasn't really in a position to, to, to sponsor uh, you and to, you know, put you in a, into a position uh, where you could move ahead. Uh, Cynthia, I see you nodding too. Um, let's talk about mentors and sponsors uh, and how they've helped us along on the journey. If I could go to you, Cynthia. Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, I think sponsors is something that has come about a little bit more recently. People are being more vocal about it because coaching, mentoring, those things, they happen in private. They happen between me and someone else. But that sponsorship happens either with me in the room or without me in the room. It's, it's kind of that old quote about, um, you know, surround yourself with people who will men mention your name in a room full of opportunities. Uh -huh. um, and I've been fortunate to have several of those. And I do want to kind of caveat a, a little bit is um, because this is a woman focused event and, and what our experiences have been here as women, but, but to just make the point that most of my sponsors, and I think it might have just been because of the organizations and how they were set up and who was traditionally in those leadership roles, but I can go back to being an enlisted service member to the, my last role, and it was primarily male allies that were the ones that were saying my names in those rooms or or females so don't think that just because it's a man they can't be your sponsor and what that means you know they they have women in their lives too whether it's their mother their daughter their you know their wives whether it's the women they work with work for the, can't get away from us we're here we're gonna be around <laughs> gotta, gotta learn how to deal with us sorry and we're not all the same you can't just group us in but just want to make that point clear too about about the allyship that that's important with that. Um, but I know I've had everything from folks. My la One of my last uh, supervisors was one of the greatest ones. And I wasn't going to name names because I'm sure I'm going to miss someone. But Dr. Timothy Bailey, if you are out there or somebody is out there, I know you're retired. Um, but somebody's going to hear that and go, yes, I know of him. I worked with him. He was yeah. the kind that would come around and go, I'm going to go up to the next floor up, right, to talk to HR, to talk to somebody else on the next floor higher than us, which we all know what that means. Right. Yes, and you come around and go, you have five minutes. Hey, you want to come with me? And even if it wasn't me saying anything or having a role, it was just being in that room, like Natalie said, being in that room, taking it all in, observing it. Um, I'm one of those that I don't care if I'm the first person or the last person on your list, why you asked me to be in this room or be at this thing. What am I going to do with this opportunity? What am I going to learn? And then how do I intern to make sure that other folks have that opportunity? I think some of the AU team could tell you. I think it was maybe a few years ago when they had invited me to speak at one of their first panels. And I said, you sure me? <laughs> and then I kind of, yeah. I shook that off and went, you're getting me. You know exactly what you asked for. This is it. You know, right. I'll get to the authenticity piece a little later because I know some of y'all tackled that. You know, it's, I, I'm a Texas tornado, right, right from the get-go. What This is what you get. I don't care if I'm at home. I don't care if I'm volunteering. I don't care if I'm at the office. This is me. So I've been fortunate, and I know, Natalie, you called them out on Monday, you know, women like Vivian, women like Lynn, some of our predecessors who have paved that way that have allowed me to be me. I'm a middle child, so I had to learn very early on who the heck I was in this whole scheme and what I bring to the table because nobody, you'll, you'll get pushed aside, you get the bad biscuits, nobody cares. Um, or my family, you, thank you, middle child love in the chat. Or, you know, you, you don't get the nice, fresh, hot off the oven tortillas. Um, but I did, I did also want to mention a point because um, all you ladies talked about you being first and, and kind of the identity piece of it. Uh, both of my parents were born and raised in Mexico. So I always felt like they chose America for us. I'm first generation American. So 
So I feel like all these opportunities I've had afforded to me just being born here and getting, getting access to those while also recognizing that mommy and daddy didn't know somebody that got me somewhere that could get me into this. And it wasn't so much of who I knew, it's who knew of me. Right. Who knew of me and was it because of firsthand knowledge, secondhand knowledge? So if you see those projects, you see those opportunities, take it. Um, if you don't think you're ready for something and, and you have a leader that comes to you and says, come with me to that office, join me on this thing, come sit in on this project, sit in on this meeting, do it. Do it and start taking notes, start thinking about how this is, you know, how this, how you can leverage this for yourself and for others. But again, without losing yourself either. So right. I, I could, I mean, this could be a whole, whole another hour just talking about this, but I want to hear from Natalie and I want to hear from Vivian. So I'm going to pipe down, but if there's anything, you know, any other follow-ups, let me know or anything in the chat, let me know. Yeah, Vivian, I mean, can you, you know, say something about that? Um, we, you know, I, I love uh, the way that we've uh, gone to this uh, issue of the importance of being in the room where it happens. Um, but sometimes you had to, you know, uh, make sure that you knocked on that door pretty forcefully to be allowed into the room where it happened. Um, can you talk about that and about, um, you know, getting yourself to the table, uh, getting yourself to the point where, you know, you maybe push past your own uh, feelings of, of, of doubt about belonging there, um, you know, which yeah. is something that, uh, you know, certainly uh, we probably all struggled with this notion of um, imposter syndrome. Well, uh, let me raise a couple of points. You know, I, I come from a different generation. Lynn, Lynn and I talked about this. I'm, I'm one of your, what you might call now a senior citizen. And, and as a result, I was at the cutting edge of a lot of things where um, I think government wasn't really ready for women, but they were required to hire women. And so those dynamics are very different than what women are facing now in terms of access and opportunity. I mean, the first that we had to do was just be at the table. I was fortunate, just like Chris, uh, she said, uh, I had male uh, mentors. And yes, I mean, it's a, it's, um, there's a fine line be making sure that you're not getting involved with them, but certainly they wanted to feel good about taking care of you, right? So I had an a, a admiral who really took to me and was really interested in, in working with me and, and thinks that he really helped my career. The truth is he gave me access, but he didn't necessarily help me in my career. It wasn't like, here, hire this woman. Mm -hmm. um, it was always because I wasn't, um, anyway, it doesn't matter. But, you know, so you look for opportunities and I looked for opportunities in the sense that I was able to put deals together. I was really a master of organizational sort of vision. And during the drug wars, I was, able, I was at um, HRSA, uh, Health Resources Services, and I was able to uh, bring a million dollars to the agency that they didn't have. And I love using other people's money to further our mission, right? So uh -huh. I did, and so, you know, you get successes and people get, you get known for that. And then, um, I didn't even have staff and they gave me people that were the hardest um, people they wanted to get rid of. And they said, okay, we'll throw you a couple of uh, guys who are just um, mediocre. And, you know, and I was able to document them and get them out of the government and stuff like that. But I think, I guess my point is you really have to have a vision. Just like I started the Office of Minority Women's Health. I helped uh, get on, um, because of that, I was on, on the Office of, um, uh, NIH where they started their diversity program and I, I was always helping formulate sort of new opportunities and putting deals together and creating opportunities. The, the key I always tell mentor when I mentor someone I always say your job is still your priority. Once you do your job people will notice you. Put your ego at the door. Start working um, toward the the welfare of the collective right right and i'm a community organizer so um you know i was always thinking about my success was always because i knew where the end point was it wasn't the federal government where we were really making a program for it was really the people that we served and when you get that vision and understanding of how to put pieces together and how to do that um so mentoring really is uh, uh like she's sort of saying that the 
sponsorship and all that other stuff is new. Even mentoring is fairly new. Back then, you know, women didn't mentor each other. Mentor women were competitive with each other back then. Right. Going right. through the system. And and it wasn't uh, you know, and there wasn't a lot of mentoring going on for women. You kind of had to find your way, I think. Uh, you had some men that would be willing to help us, but I think that it was more um, as long, if you could do your job and be as good as anyone else, because, you know, when I was hired, let me just say this, it, going past a few other employment situations, when you go, one of the people that I was, uh, the admiral I was working with, he had been sleeping with another woman and he had hired me as well. And so there's this rumor, okay, how did we even get here? And you have to ignore all that garbage, that gossiping, because it became a real gossip um, organization environment and they could go to daddy who is the admiral I call and and if you could squeal on someone then you could get ahead so I just kept my head down and I just kept working I made sure that I didn't do anything that violated policy or rules or my my values and I just kept moving ahead that way and I think that's how you really um, have to be true to yourself and once you're true to yourself, you will always move ahead. Um, and your opportunities will come, but you have to find them. Um, no one's gonna hand it to you. And that's the problem, you know, we, men were helping each other jump ahead. And women back in the 70s and 80s weren't looking to help, hey, and give announcements and say, hey, there's a job here, why don't you come? You know, it wasn't that like that. It was more, we, we kind of had to look out for ourselves, right? So, um, now I hope we're looking out for each other. I hope that we have learned to create that network of bonding just like men have to help pull people along. You know, the old adage was, you know, they knew how to work as a team because they had sports. Women weren't in sports back then, right, as much. So I'm gonna stop there. There's a lot of other situations I can um, explain, but. Um, you know, uh, we just have, we have a comment that I'm uh, reading from the, the chat about, uh, it's still the case uh, with women to some degree um, that they are not willing to, you know, that there, there's more likelihood that maybe they're going to pull up the ladder rather than give someone a, hel a hand up uh, with climbing on it. Um, I, you know, maybe we could talk about that though uh, in the federal government versus in the private sector, Natalie. I mean, you're pretty well placed to, to talk about uh, how well women do in the federal government versus in the in the private sector. Um, could, maybe, uh, you know, we could hear from you on that point. Sure. So, you know, we're at about, was it 35% right now of the senior executive service, um, about 46% of the total federal workforce are, right. you know, women um, who identify as non-white. So, you know, as far as diversity is concerned, we're growing. Um, that that senior rank is is not moving fast enough, if you ask me. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, we talked about the sponsorship, you know. Um, yeah, those 35% of, of women can't sponsor all the women, right? So yeah. we, we do. We need white males. We need men of color. We need the males who are in leadership roles to be sponsors of women, women ready to lead. Right. And, and I think that's a paradigm shift, right? That's occurring. Um, um, it, it's, been, it's been told to, it's been talked about. I don't know. I think with this administration, they're getting down to dictating. Um, I'm excited about it. But it's, it's, it's something that has to happen. We have to have our seniors um, really understand um, that this is, this is the future of our workforce. And, and not just understand it, not just talk about it, but actually put that into action. Um, I'm so glad, I'm really glad to hear you say that because, you know, another uh, common thread um, in listening to all of you is having a mentor or a sponsor, um, the, the difference being the private kind of aspect of mentorship, the sponsorship being willing to, you know, invite you along or to propose you for a position, um, at, you know, being uh, the, the difference in those two um, uh, uh, kinds of, of uh, relationships. But also, it seems to me like all of you have said, I got mentored or I got sponsored, but it was still up to me to deliver. 
I mean, you yes. got to, I mean, Natalie, talk about that from, you know, the OPM perspective. You oh. still have to perform, right? At the end oh. of the day. At the end of the perform. day. At the end of the day, you got to do what they hired you to do. Right. Right. But, and, and honestly, you know, it is, it is, it's important. It goes back to that. What is your why? Like you have to take pride in you and your deliverable, whatever it is. Yes. I do things for my leader to lead this better. So I'm part of something, but that's still my work. It's got my name on it. Right. And so the one thing I think I want to point out with sponsorship is that you have to remember that that person who's sponsoring you, if they're doing it the right way, they're putting their name with connecting it with yours. So the outcome, your individual outcome is attached to their credibility. And if you're not willing to perform in a way that sets them up for success as well as your as, your, as yourself, it's not going to happen. It's not going to keep happening. And so, you know, I, I, I encourage everyone to, you know, a coach, you know, that helps you to win the game, it helps you to win the season, right? Think about short-term things. And they're definitely necessary. But you may have multiple situations like that where you're learning how to develop certain skills that you may lack. A mentor is like a lifelong type thing. It's a longer relationship. I go to my mentor and I'm like, do you think I should take this job or do this activity? And they're like, what do you think? What? (laughs) (laughs) They they take you back to why are you here in the first place? They make you remember, you know, so you're not going on all these errant paths. You said this is what you wanted to do for the federal government. How is this opportunity going to get you there? And if it's not, then why are you wasting your time? That's a good mentor. But that sponsor... That sponsor has said, you know what, I'm willing to put my name, my credibility, my neck on the line, because I know that you're going to do a good job and you're going to make us look good and you're going to perform for the federal government. You cannot take that lightly. Um, it's, it's, it's something that I've benefited from multiple times. Um, and, and, you know, to the point that I'm almost crying because I'm like, what if I don't do a good job? That person's going to be disappointed. Yeah. Um, you got to get past that. Number one, yep. that can only be like a second. Have it, but two seconds and jump forward because you have to get to that performance part. But it's 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 beneficial um, and, it, and it teaches you something. It teaches you how to do that for someone else. So when, when that happens for you and you get that warm, fuzzy feeling inside, they saw that in me. It feels so good. You get inspired. I want to, I want to do that for someone else. When people ask me to mentor them, I'm like, I'm not that therapist person. No, you shouldn't do that. I'm I'm that person that's going to tell you that is not a good idea. Don't do that. I'm real. I'm almost too honest. Um, but some people like that, you know, some people want that level of, of in your face. And so I have lots of mentees I'm still surprised, uh, but they, they benefit from our relationship in some way. And I'm, I'm, I, I think the one thing that I'm excited when it comes to growing in the federal government is to be a sponsor, to have that influence, to build the relationships that I have now and grow stronger so that when my mentees come to me, I'm not wondering or stumped on how to be able to influence them, how to, how to, how to make that connection for them so they get to the next level. I want to be proficient, right, in, in, in my relationships across the government um, so that I have a better understanding of how to help others, women, people of color, people with disabilities, people of different orientations, people who have gender, you know, are of multiple or different gender identities. I want every citizen who feels as though they can serve this government, right, and, and be impactful to at least have the opportunity and the know-how to do it. And, and, and we, that's, if we don't do nothing else, that's a positive. Because this, this, this experience, this life choice, this career is fulfilling and rewarding. I love it. I tell people all the time, if you've ever sat into any of my sessions, my leadership about anything, my diversity and inclusion courses, I am the head cheerleader of the federal government. You can be the ambassador, Cynthia. <laughs> I'm the head cheerleader, okay? I, I am, I'm dedicated to that. That's my why. Why am I here? to champion public service yes. to public servants. That's why I'm here. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, no, I, I, you know, I think that this is something, you know, that I, I've heard in, in speaking to uh, all three of you is uh, the support for public service as, you know, a, a place where, you know, we want to give our best um, because not, not just because it's our job, but also because of the fact that, you know, public service is inherently uh, in and of itself um, uh, you know, it, it's it's both for the public, but it's also this feeling that you're giving something back to the community um, and and to your country. Vivian, um, you're well, one. Can I just add add a few things? I think it's really important that we also don't um, gloss over some of the challenges. All of us. I mean, as a female minority, I think all as a woman, we've, we've challenged, been challenged by people visually looking at you and thinking whatever assumptions they make. Okay. I think that that has been the, one of the biggest challenges that we have is really um, being authentic, but playing our role in an honest, genuine way. Now, what do I mean by that? I am not a petite Asian woman. I'm not beautiful like my sisters in terms of size and stature. I'm not quiet like a lot of them. You know, there's a lot of cultural stuff about how you present yourself being demure, etc. cetera. Um, and I, I tend to speak up. I tend to say more than maybe some people, but you have to choose when you speak up because I, that's one thing I learned is you, if you're angry all the time about what's going on because you don't see equity going on or, uh, you know, you see discrimination going on, you can't always speak up because you have to choose your battles. And I think that that's really important for women because they're always gonna be judged. Like, oh, look at that woman who's speaking out. And you know, back then it was about, were, were you assertive? Oh, let's teach you how to be not aggressive or assertive, you know, what's the right word? Um, now we, I don't hear that term as much uh, in when we talk about women uh, in their jobs. But I think that, you know, times continue to change and we have to adapt ourselves to the times and how the culture is allowing us to play, quote, in their field, right? Um, it's still a white dominated field and we still have to play the game. I hate to say it, we still have to play the game and we still have to, to be careful of how we are judged because of what we say and what we do. For Asians, it's very difficult to speak up. It's really hard. And so the question is, what kind of leader do you wanna be? And I contend that all of us and all of you are leaders. And it's a matter of what level do you wanna lead an organization? Um, you can always lead at GS 9, 11, 12. You can always lead and show how you put things together. And that's how you get recognized. When you, you bring yourself out to lead uh, a team or a project or whatever you're doing. And you're not always gonna be asked to do that. You're gonna be having to help find that and say, and volunteer, like you said, like some of us have said already. But I think as women, we still have a role. I mean, how is it that we're still dealing with racial issues and women's issues in 2000? 21. I mean, I started the government when we were dealing with these issues. And you'd think that we came a long way, but you know, when I, for instance, came to, um, like in HRSA, which is a health organization for service delivery program, I think there was a little more respect for women and their, 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 what they brought to the table. When I came to USDA, whoa, it was back to some really it's still a very male dominated because the profession is male dominated. Mm -hmm. So we have to remember where, um, where we're working and what, what's the field and what is the contexture because that's what you're used to. And, it, and it's not about, you know, like in women's lib, it used to be, well, let's go play golf with everybody and let's hang out with them the same way. And it's not the same. So I think what you have to do is find your own female um, colleagues to be, friends with and mentor with and be safe with. And, and the truth is not until I was 50 years old did I feel safe to ask another woman to really build that relationship with them and feel like that we had equal um, 
interests of each other as opposed to stabbing each other in the back to get ahead. Because mm -hmm. I, I will tell you that women have used me when I was in a position of power to get ahead and stab me in the back to move ahead of me. And that is not good. I mean, why do we do that? It's not healthy and it's not creating a good environment. And that's and if that's the way the government wants to work to jump ahead of each other, then you know it is competitive. You just have to build your 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 toolkit. That's what you have to do and your experiences. Anyway. Sorry. Well, I, I think I, I think that uh, you know that uh, issue of how it is that you build relationships uh, with people uh, is really important, whether it's with other women or whether it's finding mentors or sponsors. Um, and so, you know, Cynthia, one of the questions that's come in here uh, in, in uh, uh, the chat um, is about how, how do we reach out to people who we want to uh, be uh, our mentors or to be our sponsors? Um, yeah. I, I'm sure that uh, you know people have perhaps reached out to you, or maybe you've reached out to someone to ask them uh, for advice. How can we do that? Uh, how how can we do that while being uh, true to our core values and and to our uh, you know kind of uh, authentic selves? Yeah, and also managing expectations, right? Because every additional mentor or mentee that you take on, that's more time. Um, but to some of the things that were mentioned before, you know, a sponsorship is going to be something overt. I my, like Natalie said, my name is now tied to yours. So I got to see you deliver first. Let's be honest. I'm not going to blindly go into a sponsorship and start mentioning your name when I don't know what you can do or what you're capable of, particularly in, in this role where it is an interagency type role. Um, and I did want to just touch on one of Vivian's points about let's not live in this world where everything's perfect and because so much work has been done, everything's fine. But I can tell you that I don't have time for the extras. I don't have time for the cattiness. I don't have time for any of those things. I, does it get to me sometimes? Sure, because you hear it or you hear it in passing, but my personal brand when it comes professionally to work, if anybody tried to bring any of those types of things up, I would hope I had champions to smash them back down. But I think also most don't even bother because they go, this ain't gonna fly. People know yeah. Cynthia, they know that's not what she's about. They know, yeah. you know so um, back to the original question, but the mentorship piece, um, it's reaching out and asking. And I think what you'll see mm -hmm. more now, every agency probably has their own internal mentorship program. You may wanna branch out and go into an interagency program, whether it's something through young government leaders or some of the programs like mm -hmm. one of Vivian's organizations or maybe um, you know executive women in governments, any of these organizations have interagency ones. So you can kind of branch out of just what will work here. Um, like you mentioned before, some of us have moved around at a couple of agencies, like every other relationship. They might, it might've been right at the time. Things might've gotten toxic. You might've plateaued. There may not be spaces. You may wanna try something else as the grass greener over there. Um, so try and also be strategic with who you ask to be your mentors. Don't just limit it to who's in your agency. One of my strongest mentors was not female SESer and not in a linear capacity either essentially, you know, asked me if I could help with this one project. I didn't want to do it, not because it was beneath me or anything like that. I think that's one of the nice things about public services. There's nothing beneath me. You tell me the contract ran out and I got to empty these trash cans in the office for a week, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it for a year. I'm not going to let you take advantage of me. But if it's what I got to do to make sure the office is clear, the mind is clear, and I can do it, let's do it. Um, so I think, you know, she asked me to work on that project. I didn't really want to, but I saw it as an opportunity where she might not have time to squeeze me in on a mentorship role or to, to block out that time week to week. This is the only time I'll get. And I did have one instance with her where we were sitting in a conference room. It was her, me and someone else. And we were on a conference call, someone who really just knew how to push all the buttons and kept pushing all the buttons and was just driving me nuts and not being a good steward of government time and get to the point because we're trying to move on and be more effective. And there was one point, I guess, where my voice kind of, the tone went up and she very quickly just turned to me and said, after the call, as a woman, you're gonna have to watch that a little bit more. You're gonna be seen as irrational and emotional. And it wasn't a big grandiose moment. It wasn't a let's sit down and talk about this as an issue. It was, it happened once, she happened to be in the room she mentioned it just in passing, but to me, that was probably eight years ago. And it's a nugget that I remember and take with me, just like it was yesterday, just like it was this morning. So 
expose yourself to some of those opportunities where it's going to be not just in your own organization, but outside of it. Um, and the sponsors will find you, you know, whatever your professional or your personal branding is, whatever you do at work, they will see that and they will opt to do it. But as far as mentorship goes, ask, like everything else, be prepared for them to say no, or that they don't have time, but also realize that mentorship is formed in a lot of, uh, or has regenerated in a lot of ways. And the current one I see most of is situational mentoring, not a let's block out time every week or every mm -hmm. month to meet. It's mm -hmm. when something comes up, reach out. Let's have a quick chat. Let's not, it's not, let's go to lunch this week, obviously, especially with the pandemic. It's not, let's run out to lunch and get together and talk about this. It, it's more situational mentoring yep. than it is that. And for me, it, I don't believe in the term reverse mentoring. It's mentoring period. If we're in a mentorship or a mentoring agreement, I'm getting something from you too. Whether it's how I define, you know, how I further myself or how I hone communication skills, because you got to reach everybody a little differently. I'm getting something out of this too. So it's not just me to you. Um, but yeah, don't, don't be afraid to ask, but also be prepared to hear no or no, not yet, or maybe this other person. But like Vivian said, have something in mind. You know, why do you want this mentor? Is there a particular ECQ? It, don't do it because you're trying to get a, a job opportunity or you want them to mention your name or to, to hire you. What is it intrinsically that's motivating you to want to connect with this person? All right, I'll get off my soapbox because I know we got plenty of other Natalie, let's hear from you. Just, you just got... really quick, I don't want to belabor the point, but you know, employee resource groups are great places to make network, to network and make connections. And you may find a coach or a, a mentor or a sponsor through that relationship. Um, affinity groups, like Ajit, all those kind of, of, of networking opportunities, um, even if they're in your specific field, you know, like professional organizations. They have federal ones of those that engineers and things of that nature. You really need to, you know, put yourself in a space around the people that you want to be. So you can't just continue to go to work every day and come home and, and wonder, you know, why I'm not growing or why I'm not getting there. Where do you want to be? Go there. Talk to those people. Figure out what they're doing. Um, and, and really take an assessment of, is that what I really want to be doing? Because I've, I've done that. I'm like, oh, I want to do that. Three weeks later, I'm like, this is dumb. I don't want to do that. I don't like that. It's time to do something else. Try before you, you have to, You have to reassess sometimes, right? Um, and be okay with that decision. Um, so to do that, but I just, I just think you, you, you have to put yourself out there. You have to make those relationships. You have to. You know what? I am interested in learning what you do. Can we talk for ten seconds on this elevator about what you do and how you got there? People are flattered. I'm flattered when people ask me things like that. I'm like, what? you want to talk to me? Oh, okay. Let me give you a few seconds. Um, and I'm busy. Everybody is. We're all doing the work in two or three and four people at times. So it's, you know, there's never enough time, right? But, but we make time for things that are important. And so I just, I just encourage everyone who, if you want a coach, if you want a, a, a mentor, if you want a sponsor or to sponsor someone, do it. It doesn't have to be a formal, um, you know, written down relationship or anything. It can be very informal. Like you said, it can be situational. It can happen in a moment. It, it's, 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 it's complimentary to your service, um, I think is the, is the one thing that I like about it. And so I want to answer one question up here that I can't ignore, um, Lynn. So I'm sorry, just for a quick second. Um, one of the one of the persons in the group said, "What are one or two blind spots that you see I, in I men exactly managing and growing question. women leaders?" Yes, and this is something that I'm very it's passionate about. Saki, who I do not know, uh, oh. but it, it appears that a number of other people do know Mr. Visaki or Waisaki, uh, and, and it's a terrific question about you know, uh, uh, as a man asking what are blind spots in the way that men uh, can grow women leaders. Uh, so yeah, take that one, Natalie. I think the, I don't know if I have two, but some the one that gets me all the time is we all have our go-to, right? So when, when you get that email and as a leader or manager and you're like, oh, let me assign this to so-and-so because I know they'll get it done, right? Meanwhile, Natalie's sitting over there, bored to death, lonely. <laughs> trying to figure out our life and 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 you so my point is you know we're all inclined to go to that go-to because we want to check that box and say that's done 
right? And, and I get that. That's a task oriented, wanting to complete the job. There's nothing wrong with that. But as a manager, what's wrong with that is that you're not utilizing your full team. You don't know the strengths of your team. You don't know well, how Natalie would answer that email because you're always going to John who you've depended upon for, for you know years and years and years. And so John's end of the year performance has 754 things and Natalie's has three because that's all you've given me. And then you wonder why he gets that money at the end and I don't and I grieve it because I'm mad and we've got a whole thing that we could have avoided if maybe you had taken the time to equally disperse the work right? Or right. not even equally. If you, if you make an intentional effort right. to disperse the work in an uneven way so that the women in your group can, can have the opportunities that the men in your group have had for decades, right? And so really take it, being intentional as a leader. So we talk a lot about inclusive leadership and how that can be in any role in any position. And that's one of those things that men have the option to do, to really take a look at who, who am I selecting all the time? Who am I giving these opportunities all the time? Why, right? I'm not, it, the Rome doesn't built in a day. We're not gonna change tomorrow. But you, if, if men don't take a look at their actions, right? White males, men of color, the men of the federal workforce, remember, because they're 65%, right? If they don't take a look at themselves and say, I gotta lead differently, I have to do differently, things aren't going to change. The 35% of women cannot be what we bank our whole future workforce on. We cannot. And so I, I really, you know, looking at the, how you make decisions in distributions or allocation of the resources that you have stewardship over is key to figuring out, you know, how, how we can get women, um, you know, to, to be in different positions or in leadership positions or um, in development programs and, and graduating from them and getting appointments into the SES. That's the type of, of, of thing we need, not just from SES either. We need that from your mid-level managers, everyone really taking a, a look at why am I making this decision, period. I think it's not, we're not in the industrial management age, right? In the industrial era, scientific management, let's just mm -hmm. do time. You have to be able to look at your staff or your team and go, what are they able to do right now? What are they capable of potentially becoming? And yes. how do I match those opportunities? Because the only way we're gonna get that exposure, get that experience, get that next level of competency is through doing. I can't be better if those opportunities aren't there. And I, I think there was something, it was a Blacks in Government Symposium years and years ago that I went to. And the thing that stuck out in my mind was someone said a leader should look like this. I'm hoping my blazer doesn't bust doing this. Uh, but you know, that somebody should be pulling you up and you should be pulling somebody else up. So again, don't, don't look at it as, I'm a male, now I have to forcefully go to women or I have to go to men. women too. It's you have to sit there and go, are you providing that equally across the board? And that's why I loved calling out Dr. Bailey before because he did. On any given day, it was one of the five of us. I think there was uh, three black women, myself, Hispanic woman and one white male. And all five of us got the same opportunity every single time regardless. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all about you know making sure that you're aware enough to see that you are or aren't doing those things. Yeah, I think that unconscious bias is really important and um, self-reflection and self-accountability um, are really important because I think we don't always do our own. I mean, women have to do this too, but men should, should also do the reflection because they're so used to be in power and in control. And the question is why, why can't you change that paradigm to not let go and trust someone else to work with you. Um, there are new- yeah, Actually, Vivian, if I could jump in here, there was a question earlier about how it is that we manage uh, you know, on our teams that we might be responsible for, how do we handle uh, when we have uh, an alpha male who's kind of elbowing everybody else out of the room um, and, you know, is, is, is taking the plum assignments or, or maybe, you know, is unwilling to see the, you know, uh, discussion time at the table. How do we manage uh, those sorts of, of men uh, is the question that someone asked. Well, I think the way you have to really be a great facilitator, you really have to recognize it and be able to control 
the dialogue and how, how it's going, because I think that, you know, if you're outnumbered, if he's the only one, I think women can speak up and just, you know, put that down in some ways. But if you allow and defer to him and allow him to be an alpha male, then it's like you're sort of losing your opportunity to have him learn more about how to work as a team member and how to work as a, a, a colleague, as opposed to a, a person who needs to be in control. It's not always easy. There's a lot of, you know, just like in any relationship in, in, with women and other in, in your groups, you have to really know and be clear about, um, you know, keeping people on target and what the goal is, right? And what you're trying to do. And if they go offline to the grandstand or to try to take over, you just have to pull everyone back to making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, it's not always easy. I'm, I have to say that I think that we live in a society that's changing now and having to deal with really new issues, right? New issues about mm -hmm. equity, um, who should be at the table, how do we get to the table? How do we um, measure that without falling back into the same paradigm that we've been in, which is what I would say is uh, the, su the supremacy attitude or institutional uh, constraints that we've bought into, which is to not allow each other to be who they need to be, right? And to let everyone at the table. So I'm not gonna pull Lynn down. I'm not going to try to pull um, Natalie down just because she's either African American or she's a woman, and because I'm a woman, and I think that I need to be at the table and I need to be at the top. But I think we all have to be realistic. You know, um, Ab Arbinger. I don't know if any of you have been watching, uh, going into any of their training. It's really it's called the outside leader now, and I think that the the model that we all should be looking at is how do you start. Uh, leading a team so everyone feels that they've been nurtured and that they can have the potential to take over at any moment and that um, and it's not about my goals as a senior executive it's about all of our goals right so that's a collective thing that's a whole different Arbinger I, I highly recommend their training if you haven't seen it um, they have a number of things called um, uh, leadership and self de deception and anatomy of peace and um, other things like um, the outward mindset. So yeah, Natalie, I, I want to um, ask you about the fact that OPM uh, uh, is now in a situation, the ban having been lifted on diversity training across the federal government uh, on issues like unconscious bias. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? And what is OPM uh, going to be doing uh, now that uh, they have the opportunity to go back to recommending those kinds of trainings? Well, we previously didn't recommend trainings. Um, so understanding that, you know, agencies are different. We have very large departments. We have very small independent agencies. For OPM to recommend a specific training for everyone is difficult because um, it has to be scalable, right? Yeah. Um, so, so it's not something that we previously have done. Um, obviously, the um, Biden Executive Order 13985 rescinded the previous one, which was Executive Order 13950, which required um, agencies to submit their training to OPM for review. Um, we're no longer doing that. Don't send us your training. Got it? Don't <laughs> send us your training anymore. We're not doing that. Um, and But we're also not dictating what type of training or what the language should be or shouldn't be within those things. What we are looking at is looking at diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility to, to cover a multitude of areas under one type of learning or education component. And so, you know, we encourage the agencies to, to look at the needs of their workforce and figure out what type of education um, or learning uh, opportunities you can provide. Micro learning is a new thing where people or adults, right? We need that information fast. So those PowerPoint slides of, of 20, you know, learning and development that you got to take, are they going to cut your computer off? We, we got we to gotta move beyond that. Uh, we have to get to a space where we're really connecting with people um, to get them to understand some of the foundations of these techniques and then how they can apply it in their everyday work. Um, I think that's a lot more um, actionable, right, for the individual and less conceptual of this 
what is diversity? What is inclusion? What is equity? How do I do it? This, this is what it means. This is how you can do it today in your everyday life. Um, so we really want to get to a, a learning module where people are feeling connected to the content um, and able to, to act on it within their, within their, with their colleagues, with their senior leaders, um, and, and, and for the betterment or the growth of those areas, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility within the agency. So that's where we're moving toward. Um, hopefully we'll be coming out with some information. It's been a quick, um, what is this? It's not even 90 days yet. Um, so we got a lot of things to put out, thankful for administration and, and all that they're doing. Um, and obviously OPM is gonna lead on these things and, and we're, we're working hours nonstop to get the federal workforce what they need. You know, uh, Secretary Salazar um, mm -hmm. during the Obama administration really um, put his agency through uh, uh, everyone. It was required that everyone have cultural diversity training. I, I attended it and it's like a one week session and then you, it's a trainer of trainers kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was excellent, excellent because you actually went through what it is that you're dealing with in terms of unconscious bias and putting that on the wall and, and opening your eyes. You know, my, 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 my problem with some of the, even the uh, emphasis programs that have gone on, it's really a, a celebration of the culture, but not really understanding the American history of how we've mm -hmm. been discriminated and how we all need to be at the table. And so I've always uh, thought that, you know, one of the best things that the government could do is really come up with I want to understand your story. I want to understand what happened to your family uh, or your culture. And, and, and now we have a lot, even the new executive orders on uh, uh, sovereign rights and everything. Mm -hmm. I, I think we all have to really have a firm understanding that, you know, all of us have had some discrimination against us. And there's been federal laws against our groups that, that have created the issue of exclusion and discrimination that we all feel, but everyone thinks, no, you don't understand because mine were slaves and then and then and then and and it's like, no, I do understand. I understand what exclusion is. I understand what discrimination is. And, and all of us, it doesn't have to be a minority, ethnic minority. It can be a woman. It can be a LBGQT, what all those letters um, or you know a disabled individual. I think we have to be very clear in what that does to individuals and start to re respect one another and understand we all have to be at the table to get a better sense of what does it mean to work in a open and free society that respects one another and offers the opportunities for all of us to share what we have to bring to the table. Now, everyone has to have their um, ability to have a toolkit. I'm, I, I still contend whenever I mentor, everyone has to have skills. And that's yeah. the same with going through ECQs or anything else. So if you want what you're saying, well, how do they jump from one agency to another? Like, how do you pull together your general skills that the federal government needs and have that package so you can go to another agency if there is another opportunity. Absolutely. How, do we attract, how do we attract those folks? Because it's one thing to do the training, to talk about it, but let's be about it. You know, a lot of agencies do a great job of yeah. recruiting or it's, it's not the days of years gone past where you can say the jobs are on USA Jobs, go find it. What is USA Jobs? What job am I looking for? What series am I looking for? What, what, age, what should I know about this agency and the culture? A lot of organizations also do a great job of, you know, targeting their hiring right around or right near geographically where they are. That's all well and good if I live there, but what if I live out in the sticks somewhere, somewhere very rural, or I'm in the inner city, if we are not doing our job, because that's the whole thing about this, right? I think, Lynn, you asked something earlier. I'm doing as much as I can right now to make an impact right now, but I'm trying to leave it better for the next person to come in and make it even better. And if I'm not doing my part by going to that career day or that career fair, and not all of it's gonna be during the work day, some of it's gonna be volunteer options. STEM is not for everybody, but you know what STEM needs? People who do the payroll, people who do logistics, people who leave the lights on. We need to sit there and go, while this may not be for you, I need to expose you to this. And I need to tell you what's out there. And you know, you may wanna work for this agency, it's what you know, or it's a family member that worked there. Here, you could do that same job or a version of that job in these other agencies. Just really 
kind of exposing people more to the opportunities in federal government because they are endless. I know one of the things I do when I go do career days is I ask people, throw out a job, name a job. And yeah. I start rattling off places where they could do that in the local area. And they go, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I didn't know somebody who knew somebody that worked in government. I'm here, you know, I didn't used to think that representation was a thing, right? Because I was of that generation or, or maybe it was the immigrant mindset of my parents that said, the only person that can stand in the way of what you want to do is you. Oh, okay, wonderful, great. But then you come in and you start seeing those barriers and going, wait a minute. So I didn't tell you about them. Minute. Some of these, some of these things are a little harder to get past than others. But then as you start moving around or start moving up and you go, nobody here looks like me. Why is that? This is, this is so important. This whole notion, you know, whether it's, you know, for, for little girls or uh, for, you know, little boys of color, um, the fact that if you can see it, you can be it. You know, I think that this is something that, you know, before we maybe, uh, when Vivian and I came in, we, you know, perhaps weren't aware of why it was that we felt uh, uh, that we didn't belong or maybe that we were excluded from the tribe because there weren't people who necessarily looked like us, whether from a gender perspective or from, uh, you know, uh, skin color or, uh, or ethnicity. Um, but I definitely think that exposing to people, uh, exposing people to what their options are uh, and to the fact that they have, uh, that there is a place for them and that they are welcome, uh, I think is only to the good in terms of opening up certainly the federal workforce uh, to people who look more like America. Uh, and I know that this is something, you know, in my uh, home agency, the State Department, uh, they have uh, talked about a lot, the importance of having a diplomatic core that looks like uh, America. Uh, and, you know, uh, whether it means, you know, hiring the, the, the young diplomat who's got the dreadlocks that we never had a dreadlock diplomat before, uh, or, you know, hiring uh, more women or, uh, you know, uh, making it possible for um, gay uh, men uh, to bring their, their husbands or their partners uh, to uh, posts around the world. You know, the fact that, the fact is that diversity and inclusion um, really kind of improves uh, the way that we serve uh, our, our public. Uh, and I think that it's important that we remember that. Um, so, we have oh, uh, only sorry. about 10 minutes left and, uh, and I'd like to open this up. How do we unmute some of the people in the audience who may be raising their hands and wanting to speak here? How do we give them their voices? While we're figuring that out, I just want to say that, you know, one thing that I always tell people, I look at things, you, you were talking about the applicants and getting into the federal government. My conversation is to the hiring manager, talent is everywhere. You know, there's no diversity, right? right? There's people of color. There's people with multiple backgrounds and languages that we need, right? There's people, all, all types of disabilities, our veterans, like the talent is everywhere. So the excuse that, you know, we can't find good talent or it's not out there, it, we're, nobody's buying that anymore. It is 2021. There are some competent, you know, people ready to serve. And, and, and our systems sometimes have barriers to them getting access to becoming applicants, um, things that are biases. All the reasons why they don't get from that applicant to that interview to sitting at a desk, right? There's multiple reasons there. Are the, are the challenges that we have, to, we have to uncover, we have to look at them, we have to remedy them um, mm -hmm. because that's what's holding us back from having that talent be a part of us right now. Mm -hmm. Sorry, let's go. <laughs> okay, uh, Laman, can we uh, open this up uh, to uh, people who might want to um, ask a question to the panel? Yes, absolutely. If you are in the audience and you have a pressing questions to ask our amazing panelists, please be sure to raise your hand. There's a feature at the bottom of your participants window and we'll be sure. Oh, I see one from Gail. Um, I'm going to unmute Gail for question time. Hello, Gail. Hi, thank you. I had a question around disability. Okay, we've talked about women, we've talked about people of color and uh, and, and, and other things, but what about disabilities? Uh, what about a person who might be 
a person of color, a woman who also has a disability. I don't often see this people with disabilities represented in a number of these settings. And so what do we say to those people, especially those who want to serve, who are not yet in public service? What do we do or how do we help if you are a leader, but not necessarily one who is in a leading position that hires to help make others aware that you can't limit or should not limit what you see in a person who has a disability? Because as you said, um, I think it was Natalie, talent is everywhere. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I spent many a years in disability employment. It's still one of my key areas of concern or focus or something that I, I truly believe strongly about and passionate about, and it's why I'm at OPM. But, um, you know, your question is, is it's the intersectionality of individuals, right? And so the one thing about disability is that we all can be a member at any time, even if it's short term or long term. Um, it's, 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 the encompassing group of us all for diversity and inclusion. And so I, I you asked specifically what, what you could do. And I think the, the, the advice that I would give um, just from that question is, you know, join your employee resource group. You have to be concerned around the issues that concern you and put them forth at work because I'm not quite sure where you are or who would access to influential people that you may have in your agency. But if it's, if it's a burning desire of yours, to increase the employment of people with disabilities in your workforce, then you have to you have to network with the people that can actually make that happen. And agencies are supposed to have a selective placement. When I say supposed to have, it's optional. So it's not required, it's not mandatory. A selective placement program coordinator that works typically in HR, human resources, um, that you know really focuses on employing people with disabilities. Um, but some agencies don't have them. To be honest, um, and so you know, work with your manager when you know about a hiring opportunity. Say, you know, have you thought about hiring someone via Schedule A? Yeah. Um, and the portion of Schedule A that's hired for people with disabilities. So there's, there's yeah. other portions of Schedule A, but one specific point, I won't know the numbers, um, really focuses on just hiring individuals with specific yeah. disabilities. Mm-hmm. Point that out to people. Be that voice. So when they have times to write blogs in your in your communications or just to champion any type of effort, write a, write a paper, write a little paragraph about what the importance of hiring people with disabilities. It doesn't just have to come from the disability program manager. As an employee, once again, you can lead and be inclusive from where you are with things within your control. I, I don't know what your agency is or what you have specifically, but those are some examples of ways that you can champion the effort. Um, agencies have self-identification efforts where you individuals can self-identify their disability, typically in the human resource information system, Push that amongst your peers. Hey, have you checked your information recently? Have you done this? Talk to your human resources. Are you guys going to send out an annual notification on how people can self-identify? We're about 12% of the population right now, people with disabilities, self-identify as having a disability. That number has been slowly increasing over 35 years. We haven't really ever had a, a strong decline. So we're steadily increasing slowly, which is positive. But obviously, uh, we can have more people with disabilities in the federal government. Yeah. I hope that answered your question. That's terrific. We have a couple of other people who've raised their hands as well. Thank you, Gail, uh, for starting us off. Uh, somebody else want to, uh, to, to go, uh, Laman? Thank you all for this uh, presentation. I mean, I've just been enjoying it immensely. Um, my question is, is um, one of the things in our performance plan, of course, is to bring attention to things where you see some type of disparity to the leadership. So I did that. I mentioned that all of their acting appointments um, were filled by men and were about 60% women at my facility. And so I I just mentioned it. I said, I just want to call your attention to it. And there was a big thud of silence. And then, uh, and nothing happened. And I thought, well, how am I supposed to, I certainly don't want to elevate this above you know, my area director's head, but do you have advice on what happens when, when there's just no action whatsoever? Vivian, I was going to let you answer that one first because of your experience. <laughs> I know you have it. So if you want, I can take it, but. Uh, uh, you know, um, institutional um, culture really sometimes is hard to break. And at the top, if, if that's what they want, then you have to have a, 
ask yourself, do you really want to be there if you want to get ahead? That's all I can say. I mean, I think that there's, um, it's unfortunate if they have, don't have the vision to really promote and bring on women in leadership roles. There's a, a decision that's being consciously made. So I would, I would uh, look for something else or accept, accept their role to be a support, a leader that's supporting the mission of the, the men. Uh, it, you know, it's not necessarily a gender thing. I mean, it is a gender thing by visual. I think it's just the way that they manage. And if, if, if you can't agree with the way they control the situation, you know, sometimes we, we, we um, worry about counting how many men and how many women and how many minorities and all that. And I, I hope our society isn't gonna to continue to do that. But in the, in the absence of us shifting so that there is more diversity in the workforce, so that there are more um, qualified applicants to move to the top, try to ask one of them to, to be a mentor and say, you know, I admire you for blah, 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 because they always love being complimented. And then ask them, how, how do you see me in the organization and how can you help me? And I, I admire how you've, whatever you've done in the organization and find a way for them to be then your ally and, and to help mentor you up. If you think that there's really no chance of movement, I wouldn't stay. I would just move for another organization. Natalie, go ahead. Yeah, I know that you've also worked, uh, you know, having worked in the military and having worked at Office of, of Veterans Affairs in areas where um, perhaps there, there's been more of, a, uh, of an obvious uh, imbalance uh, between men and women. Um, how have you dealt with that? So I like Vivian's, you know, point about at some point, if it's not budging, because it's, it's twofold. Sometimes it takes that long to make one of those big aircraft carriers, one of those big battleships finally make that turn. How much are you willing to holster? Like how much are you gonna carry on your shoulders of all that before it starts to affect you? Um, but if you think I'm getting somewhere or maybe doing you know, the sly old, let me build this, this person's <laughs> pride and ego up and then maybe slowly they'll see, now I get it. So sometimes you do also, let's be, whether it's male or female, Sometimes you do have to wait until it's somebody else's idea because coming from you or someone else, but everyone's sphere of influence is different, right? Who can you leverage within that network internally at their level, at your level, mechanisms that are in place? How can, how can you get to that? I have a perfect example. Um, when I was at the VA Office of Inspector General, it's a very lean organization. A lot of IGs are, right? Um, providing oversight for, those, uh, for, for the large organizations or departments that they provide oversight for. And I had a male SESer and I had asked him once if he would come speak at one of our women's events. Cause I said, if we keep our own private little clubs and only we know what we're saying, but we never bring in the people who also need to understand and be our allies, we're not, we're doing ourselves a disservice, right? We're gonna have to continue to navigate the workplace with each other. And I asked him, I said, how did you do that? I said, cause I looked at the numbers, right, Vivian? I went to the numbers and I went, every position you vacated in the organization as you moved up was filled by a woman you were the selecting official or had a big, you know, portion of that, of that of say so and in, in who gets picked. I said, and then you look now, we, re, you know, we had re, reorganized or realigned. And I said, and you look at half of the organizations or divisions across the country that are under your purview and half of them are women. And he looked at me and said, because I didn't look at it that way. I just looked at who was the best qualified, male, female, whatever. And I was like, great, how do we replicate you? Because that, I don't want to be held to a different standard. I don't want you to lower that bar for me. I want to be able to say I was the best qualified for the job at that moment. Don't, you know, and some of that, I mentioned it in there in a blind spot, so I don't mean to piggyback off or go back to that. But some of that is the feedback. If you ask me how I'm doing, I'm not going to go, good, I'm on it, fantastic. I'm going to say, I'm great, but here's some things I'm struggling with. When I go in to do my feedback, my appraisal stuff, I'm not going to sit there and just let you say you're doing a good job. What can I do better? What more is there? Is there some training? Is there an opportunity? What, you know, how can I leverage this? Um, and I think that's something that we get a lot is, I've been guilty of it too. I think early on overseeing a female and I treated her differently than I would have a male. 
I maybe wasn't, because I didn't want to be seen as the female that was holding down another female. And really, I sat there and went, would I have treated her differently if it was her predecessor and he was resistant to some of the feedback I was giving? Because he was open and receptive and ready to move forward. But it was just this one situation. And I, of course, didn't hold myself accountable and say, this is the same thing you pick on on other things where you say, keep the standard the same. Don't treat me differently. Um, so I would say, yeah, it is. Sometimes you have to recognize when you need to cut that off, though. Um, is it organizationally? Is it historically? Are these things there? But there's many things that you have in your tool belt that you may not know you have. Leverage those. Leverage that elevator conversation, surveys, anonymous suggestion boxes, anything you have there, and organizational ombuds, whatever it is, leverage those opportunities to make sure that your voice is heard because somebody else may have that same issue, but they're not voicing it or not ready to voice it. And like I said, sometimes it needs to come from someone else, you know, and how frequently are you willing to beat that drum before they go, she's the troublemaker, here she goes again. The data helps, but the data doesn't tell the whole story. So make sure that you're supplementing that data with the anecdote, with the how does this impact the culture? How does this impact my ability to move up? Absolutely, Cynthia. You know, um, I was working in Canada in 2015 when uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was elected. And uh, there was a lot of attention focused on the fact that he committed to having a gender balanced cabinet for the first time in Canadian history. Uh, and he did that. And asked why he felt, you know, there was a lot of teasing in the media about the feminist in chief who was now going to be prime minister of Canada. They asked him why he wanted to do that. And he said, because it is 2015. Well, you know, I feel like we're extraordinarily lucky that in 2020, Joe Biden made the decision to select a woman as his vice president. Uh, and, uh, you know, they won the White House and watching the uh, decisions that are being made about nominations to the cabinet, you know, you, you have the impression that it really does start at the top and hopefully that whole idea of uh, the fact that women are equally qualified to be, whether it's vice president or whether it's, uh, you know, head of OPM or uh, secretary of the interior uh, and head of the of uh, national intelligence. Yes. The fact is that women can do these jobs because in fact, women are qualified to do them. So I do think that seeing this from the top, uh, hopefully uh, will signal uh, a change overall with respect to uh, women in, in key uh, executive positions in government. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, any last thoughts uh, from anyone on the panel? Um, anyone want to talk about uh, something that we left out? Uh, I just wanted to include that the administration does have a, um, a White House Gender Policy Council. So, you know, the, the future of women and girls is, is looking better, hopefully, and, and it will be strong. Um, and hopefully this conversation 10 years from now will be completely different and we'll all be like, oh, I remember when I did that. And, and, <laughs> and it'll be exciting. So I'm looking forward to the future. Yes, the, the future looks pretty bright in, in that regard. 